Alright, welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about some properties of definite integrals. These are just ways you can manipulate a definite integral to help you solve a problem, depending on what information you know, or maybe just how the problem is set up. So if I draw a graph here, let's say it's just some shape, and we have a portion above the horizontal axis from A to B, and then below the horizontal axis from B to C. This is just what I'm going to use as my sample here to give us a visual for the properties we're talking about. So first off, if we're looking at the integral from A to C, we can rewrite this as the integral from A to B plus the integral of B to C. So if we have a single function, this is a graph of f here, and we're looking at it over an entire interval, we can break it up into smaller intervals and add them up. I like to think of the top bound of the first integral, A to B, matching with the bottom bound of the second integral from B to C. And because those match, we can sort of combine them together into one integral from A to C. Okay, the next thing is, if we're looking at the integral from A to B, we can rewrite it as the negative integral from B to A. So the way this works is that if we're going from A to B, from left to right, the area is positive because it's sort of on the left-hand side as we are walking from A to B along the axis. However, if we switch this direction and we walk from B to A, that area is now on our right-hand side. So this area is now negative since it's on the other side. So I like to think of when we switch the direction, we're just switching which part is positive and which part is negative. This is just a visual that might help you, but really you can just remember that if you switch the bounds, you add a negative to the integral. And the next thing is, is that if we are looking at the integral from A to A, this is always zero. So we're looking at the area under the curve on an interval that has nothing, it's just from A to A, so that's zero, there's no area there. Okay, we have just two more properties that I think are useful. These are more useful when you are actually solving a definite integral problem, so you might find yourselves manipulating the problem in certain ways when you're trying to find a definite integral, just to make it easier on yourself. So firstly, if you're looking at the integral from a to b of c times a function, where c is just some constant, you can factor the c out of the integral and then just do the integral on its own. So you can do c times the integral from a to b. This is helpful just to simplify what you're looking at, and so you have the constant on the outside and you can just focus on the integral. This is also similar to how you, when you take derivatives, you can consider the derivative of just the function and then multiply it by the constant at the end. Then lastly, if we're looking at the integral from a to b of one function plus or minus another function, we can just split this up into the integral of each function. So this is the integral from a to b of f plus or minus the integral from a to b of g. So the idea is if you have a bunch of things inside your integral being added or subtracted, you can split them up into individual integrals. This is, corresponds to the similar derivative rule where if you have a sum or difference of functions you're trying to take a derivative of, you can just take their individual derivatives and then add or subtract them at the end. Basically, these properties just tell you that integrals work the way you want them to. You can multiply by constants and you can add or subtract them in the way you think you would. Okay, so let's try some examples where we use these properties. First, I'm going to have us rewrite the following integrals as a single integral. So we're going to look at the integral from 0 to 5 of f of x dx plus the integral from 5 to 7 of f of x dx. Then for another problem, we'll look at the integral from negative 2 to 3 of g of x dx minus the integral from 4 to 3 of g of x dx. And lastly, we'll do another problem that looks like the integral from 6 to 15 of f of x dx plus 1 third times the integral from 6 to 15 of g of x dx. So remember, we're going to use the integral properties we just talked about. If you'd like, you could pause the video now and try these on your own, see if you can figure out how we combine them into a single integral, but I'm going to just go forward and try them out. All right, so on this first problem here, I'm noticing that we have bounds from zero to five and then from five to seven. So the top bound on that first term and the bottom bound on the second term match, and so we can combine these together into one integral. Or you can think in your head, sort of walking along a number line. I'm walking from 0 to 5, and then I keep walking from 5 to 7. So to walk the whole way would be from 0 to 7. 
So I can rewrite this as the integral from 0 to 7 of f of x dx. Okay, now for the second problem. So here it's not quite as clear to me how I'm going to combine these together, but I'm seeing that they have one number in common on the bounds. They each have a 3 in the bounds. So what I would like is for that second term to be an integral from 3 to 4 rather than from 4 to 3. I'd like that 3 to be on the bottom. So what I can do is put a negative sign there and swap the bounds using that rule where we can swap them with a negative. So I'm really subtracting a negative integral from 3 to 4 of g of x dx, where that negative comes in because we are flipping the bounds. Okay, then I can combine the minus minus and make them into a plus. And so I have two integrals where the top bound on the first one and the bottom bound on the second one match up. So I'm going from negative 2 to 3, then from 3 to 4, meaning the entire way I'm going is from negative 2 to 4. So I can put these together as one integral, negative 2 to 4, of g of x dx. Just as a comment, it is important that the integrand, the thing we are integrating, is the same on these examples. So the first example had f of x as the integrand for both integrals, and the second example had g of x as the integrand. We can only combine these together in this way because they have the same function, the same thing inside the integral. You can just think of how you can't really combine like terms unless they are like terms. So here we need to have like integrals in order to combine them. But on this next example, you'll see that the bounds are already set and what we are integrating changes. So either what's inside the integral needs to be the same or the bounds already need to be the same. You can't mix and match. Okay, let's do our final example in this category. So here we are looking at the integral from six to 15 of f plus one third times the integral of six to 15 of g. So here the bounds already match six to 15, but the integrand, the things we're integrating change. So it's only because the bounds are already the same that we can combine these together. So first off, remember I'm trying to put these together into one integral. I'm gonna move that constant in front of the second term. So I'm gonna take that one third and put it inside the integral so now I have the integral from 6 to 15 of f plus the integral of 6 to 15 of 1 third g of x. Then, now that I have two integrals with the same bounds, I can combine them into one integral from 6 to 15 of f of x plus 1 third g of x. And just remember, all of that is in the integral. That's all being integrated over those bounds. And we can combine them together because the bounds are the same. And we've done it. We've put everything into a single integral. Okay, so the other way that these integral properties come in handy is if we know some integrals already, some values of some integrals, and we want to use them to our advantage. Let's see what this might look like. So I'm going to say that we know, so suppose that the integral from negative 5 to 1 of f of x dx is equal to 2, and the integral from negative 5 to 1 of g of x dx is equal to negative 3. Then we're going to evaluate the following definite integrals. So even though we don't know what f and g are, we do know some of the integrals, and so we're going to use them to help us answer these questions. So let's do the integral from negative 5 to 1 of negative 4 f of x plus g of x dx, and the integral from 1 to negative 5 of 5, 6 g of x. So if you'd like, similar to the last set of examples, you can pause now and try these out on your own but I'm just gonna jump right in and try them out since this might be the first time you've seen something like this. So for our first example, I'm going to break this up into multiple integrals so I can use the information I was given. So I know the integral of f and the integral of g, so I'd like to get something that looks like that. So let's split this up into two integrals. We're doing the integral from negative five to one of negative four f plus the integral from negative five to one of g. So this second term, the integral of g, we know what this is given the problem, so we've sort of gotten this to where we want it to be. For the first term, I'm going to factor that negative 4 out front, and so I have the negative 4 times the integral from negative 5 to 1 of f, plus the integral from negative 5 to 1 of g. And now, that integral with the f is something we know, we were given it in the problem, and so I have this broken down into things I know given the information. So really I'm doing negative 4 times 2 plus negative 3 and I'm getting negative 8 minus 3 which is negative 11. 
And there you go, that's the answer for that first integral. Now for the second one, let's look at the integral from one to negative five of five, six g of x. So first off, I like to just factor out that constant. I don't want it in there. So I'm gonna take the five sixth out. Then I'm noticing that these bounds are in the opposite order of what I was given. So often we put the smallest number on the bottom and then the biggest number on the top. It's just often how we see information provided, but sometimes it's written the other way. So here we have one from one to negative five. I wanna swap that to be from negative five to one, put that negative on the outside. So switching the bounds means I have to add a negative. And now I have something that I know the answer to. So I know the integral from negative five to one of g. I was given that information, that's negative three. And so my answer is negative five six times negative three. That's 15 over six, which is just five over two. And there you go. That's the answer to the second integral. Okay, so this is just a little bit of how we are going to manipulate definite integrals. We can do problems specifically where we're asked to manipulate them, or sometimes these things might just come in handy when you're doing definite integral problems in the future. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.